Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Simply Bitcoin IRL. Today, we have a very special guest, Jamison Lopp. Jamison Lopp is the co-founder and chief security officer over at CASA. Before we jump into the show, I do want to give a quick shout out to the Bitcoin company that makes this show possible. Of course, I'm talking about Bitcoin Well. Bitcoin Well is the best place to build your automatic self-custody Bitcoin stack. It's a publicly traded company coming out of Canada that recently expanded to all 50 U.S. states. It is self-custody by default, meaning you can't buy Bitcoin on Bitcoin Well unless you're going to take self-custody. So check out BitcoinWell.com today. And uh, no more delay. Let's bring up uh, Jameson up on stage. Jameson, I'm so happy uh, that you're joining us today. I've, I've been trying to get you on uh, on the show for, for a very long time. So I'm very hyped that uh, that you agreed. And uh, it's, it's truly an honor. You bet. Uh, is this sufficiently IRL? I feel like I'm still in cyberspace. Yeah, I mean... It's it is because it, it, it you know what compared to our, our our live show which is a little bit more scripted uh, and this is more kind of conversational maybe it's semi IRL to to be safe I guess fair enough uh, yeah I mean I like to do it live yeah absolutely live uh, live makes it a little bit more uh, spontaneous right so anyway so J uh, Jameson the reason I reached out to you is uh, you came out with this article recently March 24th 2024 and uh, the headline of the article is Congress is unconstitutionally criminalizing privacy and this is actually something that we've been covering personally on, on simply Bitcoin uh, live for quite a while now and it seems like the Fourth Amendment has completely been thrown out the window. Uh, you know, the recent FinCEN proposal that, you know, Elizabeth Warren took advantage of the, you know, the the uh, tragedy that's going on in, in, in Gaza and Palestine and Israel and uh, to, you know, try to make certain moves. Uh, the, her bill in, in Congress, which has 20 senators signed up to it, including two Republicans, uh, which would be, to use Pierre Richard's own words, a de facto ban on Bitcoin mining in the U.S., uh, the pressure that was put on the FinCEN uh, with that crazy proposal. Uh, basically, every single address had to be reported. Uh, it, you know, basically, it would, it would affect Lightning as well. And then, uh, you know, the, the congressional testimony by Tom Emmer, where he got the head of the FinCEN to admit that terrorists prefer using the traditional financial system. But of course, none of these proposals, none of these laws are ever walked back, right? So clearly this is something that you've been on top of as well. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Well, kind of. Uh, I mean, really, like you were speaking to, these attacks are coming from many different sides. And unless you're a lawyer who specializes in cover, none of us really even have enough time to stay on top of all of these things especially if you're talking about trying to stay on top of all of the laws and changes. And so this one in particular, this Corporate Transparency Act that I just wrote about a few weeks ago, it had been in the works for many years. I mean, I think it was originally proposed back in 2019, if not earlier, and it just took them a number of years before the proposed change got rammed through. And in this particular case, it got rammed through with the National Defense Authorization Act, which is basically one of those 1,500-page, um, you have to pass it or else everything shuts down type of bills. So when people have something that they want uh, to get passed, they try to shove it all you know, into this omnibus bill and then hope that nobody reads the multi-thousand-page bill. And so I don't think I even heard about the Corporate Transparency Act until maybe late last year, where it had already been passed uh, several years ago, but it wasn't you know, going into effect until January 1st of this year. And so I really started hearing about it this year because I have at least 10 different corporations uh, that I operate for a variety of different purposes, uh, you know, investments, asset ownership, uh, especially privacy uh, around asset holdings, real estate vehicles, stuff like that. And so basically I started getting hit up by all my different attorneys and other legal uh, entities that are managing my uh, 
various companies and, and assets because they're basically telling me, hey, we need you to go fill out all of this paperwork uh, by the end of the year for all of your corporations. Otherwise, uh, I think at least in some of the cases, they were threatening to drop me as a client, you know, if I was not in compliance. So, you know, it started to affect me personally, and I started looking into this. And then when we saw this judgment come out recently that it was unconstitutional, and I was like, hooray, I won't have to do any of this bullshit. Uh, but then I read that, no, I still have to do it anyways, because FinCEN is saying that they're going to uh, enforce the unconstitutional law. So that's what really threw me for a loop and got me to you know, write about this. Uh, and I mean, we've seen many different uh, outrageous uh, and sometimes hypocritical things uh, you know, coming out of the authoritarian land. But uh, you know, when it gets this far and I'm actually facing having to jump through a bunch of hoops in order to comply with a law that has already been deemed unconstitutional, you know, the, the level of ridiculousness just goes through the roof to the point of like, I'm going to shout. About it. It, uh, it seems like you, you cut off there for a sec. Um, but uh, so and I, I kind of wanted to read some of this, uh, what a, what some of the consequences are of, of the quote unquote noncompliance. Uh, so it says civil penalties of up to five hundred dollars per day, criminal fines of up to ten thousand dollars and imprisonment imprisonment for up to two years. So, I mean, like this is pretty uh, <laughs> you mentioned it, right? It's unconstitutional. Uh, what's the fourth amendment, right? No unreasonable search and seizure. I think, uh, I think this is unreasonable to, to say the least, but if it was already deemed unconstitutional up, how do they keep getting away with this anyways? Well, the legal system is really complicated, right? Um, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I've only dabbled in trying to follow some of the legal cases in this space over recent years. And, um, especially on the civil side of things, like following a lot of the Craig Wright shenanigans, I've certainly lost a lot more faith in our legal system than even the modicum of faith that I had in it to start with. Um, To justice is a like five bill um, was not fun was not something that I recommend going through but I think the the short version is that you know, there's so much complexity within the legal system that it's almost never over as long as someone who's fighting a battle within the legal system is willing to continue devoting resources to fighting yeah absolutely um and also you know there's something that me and me and my co-host were kind of theorizing about um, just essentially a, a, a lot of these regulations. It's it's almost as if they're structured in a way where they're specifically being hostile towards not only the industry but the technology itself. And that was kind of a theory that we had for you know a couple months, right? I mentioned the Elizabeth Warren proposal earlier uh, in your specific case in, in this piece, right? It's another, of course, proposal or, or recommendation from from the FinCEN. Um, but what was interesting to me is uh, yesterday during the uh, Bitcoin Policy Institute Summit, uh, we had a U.S. senator that basically said the choir part out loud. I actually have the clip. It's about a minute long, a minute or two long. So I'm going to play it and then uh, we'll talk about it. Sure. So the state of play on Capitol Hill uh, is, I think, best explained by what I see as the overarching motivations. And in this administration, um, there are a number of uh, high-ranking policy positions that are held by people who are threatened by Bitcoin because they know they can't control it. They know it's decentralized. Uh, they know its potential. And these are people that are so wedded to the government 
uh, being in control of uh, the money, how it's spent, uh, how it's used, uh, that they find it threatening, uh, that something exists that they can't control. And so with that policy overarching motivation, we're seeing things like a proposed 30% tax on Bitcoin mining. We're seeing things like that truly odd um, regulatory overreach by the energy, EIA, uh, Energy Information Ad uh, Administration over at Energy, uh, to send out questionnaires about uh, mining uh, consumption of energy that was just egregious. Um, and so these are the policy headwinds that the um, Bitcoin world is facing right now. Um, and it's really, I think, entirely based on this administration's fear of things they can't control. So Lop, what's your, what's your take on that? I mean, this is something, at least I'll speak for myself and, and, and my co-host Opti. We, we were we, basically like, we didn't find a smoking gun, but for me, it just seemed like, uh, how do I put this in a nice way? It, it just seemed like their, their intention, I questioned their, intent, their intentions and their motives. So, you know, someone who has been in the space for quite a long time, uh, I would say is, is successful in his own right. Uh, Lop, what's your take on this? I mean, it, it's, it's a center saying this, so obviously it, it holds a little bit of weight. Uh, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, this is nothing new. Um, you know, government is uh, by design an authoritarian entity, and it seeks to have as much control as possible over everything within its domain. Of course, when we talk about the United States, uh, you know, basically the United States considers the entire world to be its domain. So things get even uh, trickier there, uh, you know, as the United States tries to exert its uh, control and influence in a variety of different ways, uh, you know, regardless of what jurisdiction you're in, um, especially by claiming in many cases that, you know, if you even interact with United States citizens, that you're going to fall under uh, their sphere of influence in a variety of different regulatory ways. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not anything I think against Bitcoin in particular, uh, the government is, is afraid of any technology that threatens its ability to observe, to surveil, and therefore to control the actions of the, the people within its sphere of influence. So, you know, we're seeing similar types of ridiculous uh, proposals to strip people's privacy away, for example, um, even proposals to basically KYC your very internet connection, uh, just to make sure that you know anyone who goes to an adult website is actually an adult, for example, and you know so this this type of cat and mouse game uh, is going to continue. Uh, I think in perpetuity that you know we continue to invent technologies that help us uh, evade you know government and other authoritarian surveillance regimes and then they react and uh, this this type of battle i think is never really going to end and so anyone who really cares about it i think should be paying some amount of attention to it and be willing to put some um uh big advocate of things uh, you know actually powerful uh, and make it more difficult for the authorities to exert control over you but uh, here we are just uh, talking about it in general is is one way that we're contributing to this you know getting awareness out there so and and it's interesting the the way that you approach it which is basically the the kind of like an arms race in a way right you know you're you're, you're yeah. just trying to like constantly trying to stay ahead of the curve but I, 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 and maybe I'm naive to think this, but I, I've come to this kind of this realization that 
current U.S. sanction policy and current like how the government u- views the relationship with money in a way is kind of incompatible with how Bitcoin works in the sense that, you know, if enough of the populace adopts Bitcoin and they're using it for, you know, transacting, their ways of controlling the money flows are going to be severely diminished. If not, you know, like they're not going to be able to assert as much control as, as they, they once have, have had in the past. So, I mean, won't there reach like kind of like a breaking point in, in a sense where, uh, you know, it either goes one way or goes the other way. Like, are, are we going to go the route of, of, uh, of, you know, communist China? Are we going to go the route of, what this country was originally founded on, which we've completely <laughs> gone away from. So is there like yeah. an inflection point, so to speak? Uh, I mean, I generally like to remain optimistic, but, you know, I'll say, you know, in this particular example, you know, we're talking about a flagrant violation of the Constitution. Um, I do believe that any government at least historically regardless of how a government is formed power tends to consolidate power and of course power corrupts and so on and so forth but i think what power corrupts really means is that uh any sort of entity whether it's a single person or an organization or whatever that has power over a long enough period of time they want more power like you never have enough power uh, and so the incentive is to use your power to create more power, gain more resources, so on and so forth. And so I think that you know, that is generally the impetus for what de- causes declines in civilization. Uh, and so, you know, America has had a great run and we, we did a really good job putting a lot of these um, laws in place at the inception of America. And those laws have staved off the decline and the rise of various authoritarian regimes within the government. But, you know, it's been several centuries, right? Uh, it's uh, it, it's only going to last for so long, I think, before there will be some sort of inflection point, breaking point, whatever. Um, and you know, hopefully it can be peaceful rather than violent. But this is one of... One of the questions that I've been grappling with for a while, uh, which is that it seems like we are the frogs in the proverbial simmering pot that's, you know, close to boiling. And, you know, every time one of these egregious new laws uh, comes out, I ask myself, you know, at what point will people say, Because Alice is obedient, complacent, naive, you know, too busy living their lives to pay attention, you know, just trying to survive because uh, their purchasing power keeps going down, uh, you know, a million different variables at play. But is it the case that there are so few of us who are even paying attention anymore that there's not going to be a sufficient pushback? My My only, or at least my primary point of optimism of pushback, at least in the the Bitcoin regulation space, is the fact that Bitcoin has become so valuable and there are so many people and organizations with so much money and resources on the line now that they're going to be more willing to put resources into fighting uh, the political apparatus. But with regard to all of the other stuff that's infringing on our freedoms, I'm not quite as optimistic. Yeah, and and it's interesting the the way that you phrase that because it it, it it's almost yeah, of of course you you are on Bitcoin Twitter lop so of course you've seen this meme but basically you know there's this guy cooking a barbecue and it's like you know it's Bitcoin or slavery or something like that and then the meme like says it like basically like that's cool did you see the game over the weekend and it's just it, it's almost as if so many people are still um 
how do I say it? basically stuck in the fiat matrix like they're they're so blind to what's going on they're so distracted by the bread and circuses um, mm -hmm. that it's like yes there's 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 definitely a, you know a group of us that are awakened but we're definitely in a minority <laughs> compared to uh, you know the rest of the populace that is just kind of like willing willingly like kind of it's, it's what you said they're 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 being you know metaphorically boiled in this in this pot. And they're like, it's nice and warm in here. And, you know, I can order Uber Eats and I can watch Netflix from here. And it's very nice, you know? Yeah. Um, well, so. You know, I think there's there's a few things going on, right? Is um, uh, on one hand, I've seen you know, plenty of people uh, speak out about the sort of homogenous nature of a lot of us in the space uh, or in a more crass way to, to put it. Uh, a lot of Bitcoiners are, you know, uh, young to middle age white guys uh i would say that it's like a maslow's hierarchy of needs things um and it, i've seen similar stuff sort of in the libertarian space um or you, you some might call it the sort of uh, like weaponized autist space as well when you get to some of these uh fringe groups that are just thinking about the sort of the state of existence differently and and uh not agreeing with the status quo uh you know i think that you have to be at a certain level of comfort and uh, time and resources to even be thinking about that stuff in the first place much less to even have the level of optimism that you can do anything about it and that you should even spend any of your time thinking about it talking about it uh so we certainly should recognize, I think, that uh, we are privileged enough to be at the, the level that we can have these types of more you know, philosophical discussions. But um, the next question is obviously, OK, talking about it is great, but what action can we take? And then that's where the questions get much more gnarly of like, do we do we fight the system within the rules of the system? Or do we uh, exit the system and try to fight it uh, from outside of the system? And obviously, with, with Bitcoin, that's uh, it's great because it allows us to exit. Uh, but you know, we still have a lot of ties to the existing system, and I think we should assume that the powers that be are going to put more and more pressure on all of the choke points. What are all the choke points? I mean, it's basically all the custodians, all of the bridges from traditional finance. And um, you know, one of my bigger worries lately is the fact that like over 80% of the Bitcoin and all of the ETFs is held at Coinbase. That's a single point of failure. It's not great to think about the sort of um, extreme edge cases, uh, attacks, uh, things that could happen if far too much of the Bitcoin supply gets uh, into the hands of far too few people. But uh, I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Unfortunately, the incentives and the way that the system is set up tends to push things towards centralization. Yeah. 100%. By the way, there's about 450 you got 450 of you guys watching live. So if you guys are enjoying the show so far, make sure to smash that like button. So a lot you mentioned the kind of the centralization of the the custody of of the Bitcoin ETFs, right? All all the Bitcoin that's being custodied with with Coinbase. Um, I also heard a rumor that Brian Armstrong uh, keeps it in his uh, nightstand in, on, on a cold card. <laughs> and uh, that's that's where it's that's where all the Bitcoin's at. Uh, but maybe it's just a rumor. Um, no, but seriously, I, I think, though, like what I'm seeing and one of the things that I've run into, um, you know, being in Bitcoin for my eighth year is the specifically for the older generation is the difficulty of of uh, self custody. It's something that you guys do incredibly. I recommend Casa all the time. Um, that you guys make the uh, the multi sig aspect of it uh, easy and easy to use, where if you were if you were to set it up yourself, it becomes incredibly kind of complicated in a way, right? You, you guys have the two of three that you offer. You guys have the three of five, um, 
And uh, not only with the haptic feedback when, you know, you sign it, it makes a little nice noise ding, 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 when you do the key check and all that stuff. Oh. So you, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you, you create a, a pleasant experience uh, to take self-custody uh, specifically for the older generation. Now, my question to you is, do you see a world where people are, are taking self-custody? Because it, it almost seems like if they had a choice between the convenience aspect of it, it's like, yeah, I got Bitcoin. I have the BlackRock ETF. This is great, right? And then as Bitcoiners are like fighting this yeah. uphill battle, whereas in, in, in specifically in my family, I'm like the Uncle Jim. Like everyone has their Bitcoin in cold storage, but they don't know how to access it. They have to call me every time. So, you know, how, it, 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 is that a solvable problem? Is that something that, you know, is, is that something that perhaps us Bitcoiners don't really, we haven't come to terms with the fact that human nature is human nature and people are just going to sometimes just like convenience is convenience, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this is one of the difficult things uh, when it comes to having discussions, especially around CASA and our design decisions and trade-offs. Um, and a lot of the more And some of these absolutely correct that, you know, if you want the strongest possible security model, if you want to actually benefit from all of the things that Bitcoin has to offer, then you have to be your own bank. You have to take custody and you have to take some modicum of responsibility when you do that. And this is certainly the biggest thing that we're fighting against. And as you noted, you know, Casa has a lot of really uh, cute little design uh, quirks and aspects and things that are meant to help engage the person and make the app as easy as possible. And that's by design. Like, uh, we are not designed like a lot of other wallets out there. We try to keep it as simple as possible. Do because in, in many cases it's and actually has you know potential foot guns and pitfalls in there for novice users uh, and we want to have them avoid that so you know we go for ease of use safety and simplicity over pretty much everything else and you know in a perfect world uh, yeah I would love for you know, everyone to be doing self custody. Uh, doing it on their own uh, themselves without having to get help from anybody. But once again, I think it comes back to the, the sort of issue of uh, time and resources and you know, what are people willing to, to spend their time learning and doing. Um, so you know, we basically try to bring down the, the amount of effort that is required to get yourself into a self-custody setup and we you know, kind of put in guardrails to make it hard for people to shoot themselves in the foot you know it's always going to be possible to shoot yourself in the foot if you have custody of your keys uh, but we just try to make it so that you, you basically have to shoot yourself multiple times before you uh, enter into a catastrophic loss but this is I would say our greatest enemy. Um, you know, from time to time, there I'm sure you've seen uh, on uh, Bitcoin uh, Twitter that there is will be beefs and stuff between various uh, hardware and and software companies and self custody and stuff. And it's it's always interesting to see the sort of different perspectives there. But I should be very clear that our competitors our enemies are not other self-custody companies it's the custodians the self-custody companies should really be directing all of their fire at the custodians and how do you do that well unfortunately we're competing against convenience and you know convenience and this is one of my more i guess black pill uh perspectives on this is that over the past decade it seems to me that humans tend to prefer and prioritize convenience over everything else obviously there's some edge cases uh and i am uh, you know an edge case i don't fall into this a lot of the people watching don't fall into this but by and large uh, humans tend to take the path of least resistance to meet whatever their objective is and so if 
the vast majority of people you know coming into bitcoin are mainly looking at it as an investment then they're going to say you know what's the easiest fastest quickest way for me to have financial exposure to bitcoin as an investment and they're probably not going to go deeper into the rabbit hole and think about security models and hedging against 6102 attacks and all the other things that us super paranoid bitcoin folks have been talking about uh so that's why it's, I think, tantamount uh, for any sort of self-custody service manufacturer, provider, whatever, to put an extremely high amount of effort into their design and their user experience to make it as dead simple as possible. Because otherwise, what you end up with is uh, a story that I've heard quite frequently is even amongst a lot of people who get to the stage where they buy a hardware device in many cases that hardware device just sits in their drawer unopened and you, they don't actually take it out set it up and much less move any funds to it because it's just it feels like too much work too much friction and uh it's too scary you know to take on that responsibility for a lot of people yeah yeah and and, and that's something that you know i i've i've unfortunately i've you know because we all come from it from the from and I'm sure Jameson, you fall into this category, right? Where you just, you come to it from like the utopian vision. It's like, oh, we have the tools now, right? We have self custody. <laughs> and then it slowly starts to hit you, right? When, uh, you know, you meet with your family or Thanksgiving and then, you know, you're the Bitcoin IT. I'm not just saying in my case, it's like, I'm the Bitcoin IT guy. And then, you know, it's just like, okay, right. how are you doing sister? She's like, um, I have my, I have, I have, I have the ledger, but I, I, f I, f I forgot the password. And I'm like, okay, no problem. Do you have the words? She's like, what do you mean? What words? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> right. And, and it's just, it's, it's happened so many times. And then it doesn't matter how many times you explain it to them. Um, and then that kind of leads me back to, uh, what you guys offer specifically with the three of two, the two of three and the three of five where in a way I, I don't I don't want to you guys make it idiot proof essentially right you guys make it extremely difficult for um what you said for someone to shoot themselves in the foot um if you know they at least right um you know secure some of their words right so already two two of the two of the keys are are relatively easy to recover the, the you know the casa recover key and then the the mobile key and then, you know, all you really yep. need is just one, hopefully one of those 24 words, right? Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing about that two of three setup is even if they, if for some reason they don't store the seed phrase to the hardware device or they lose it or whatever, then it's almost impossible to lose your mobile key because we do an encrypted cloud backup of it. And then, of course, the Casa key has multiple redundant backups, so it's not going anywhere. Um, and so... That's that's what it kind of comes down to is uh, assuming the user is going to make a lot of stupid mistakes and actually trying to design the product around the understanding that people are human and people make mistakes. This is where um, you know a lot of the the wallets and, and products that are out there I think are built by nerds for nerds and they aren't really they aren't putting. person off the street interact with all the different ways that they can screw it up um, you know that's that's one of our very important uh, design philosophies when we're building stuff is actually you know put non nerdy people in the driver's seat of the beta product and just watch them fumble around with it this is kind of the level of convenience that you need to have in order for technology to get adopted so let's you know, travel back a few decades uh, to the 90s and we're let's say we're cypherpunks and we're really excited because this uh, PGP thing is pretty good privacy ha has been put out there and it allows anybody with a computer to 
uh, engage in encrypted communications with, with other parties and knowing that they can't be intercepted even by nation states and you know military level uh, hardware that can try to crack that encryption. This is, this is great, right? There's a crypto anarchy is right around the corner because the state has, uh, has been effectively neutered and can no longer uh, surveil all of our communications. Well, you know, that didn't happen, and it's because PGP never had a good, uh, and PGP probably never even got a fraction of a percent of adoption uh, across the world. Now, obviously, I use it regularly, but uh, it's incredibly difficult, and I, it's, I, I don't even recommend it to anyone else. I, I figure, you know, you basically have to be an uber privacy nerd uh, to be interested in sort of that level of communications. And if you care that much, then you'll probably be willing to you know, jump through all of the hoops to actually get it working. But thankfully, you know, over the past few years, we've had much better uh, secure communications technology and apps coming out, and they seem to be coming out faster and faster. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Keat, for example, uh, the hole punch protocol, like getting some real peer-to-peer -peer encrypted communications going on. Um, it's still got a fair amount of work to to see that and with the usability of you know any regular chat app. You know, if you can use Telegram, you can use Keat. Yeah, a hundred percent. hundred percent. I think you, you hit the nail on the head because it, if the level of convenience is not uh, close to, or it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the, the human experience It's the convenience aspect. And then you kind of see this with the, you know, with the, I'm a huge fan of, of kind of like the rise of, of sovereign computing that we're seeing. Right. Um, which is so cool, right? You know, it started with the Bitcoin node and now you're seeing all these other applications that are starting to build, be built on top of it. And essentially it's kind of the same thing, but if the convenience aspect is not there, right? Uh, people are always going to pick the cloud option because the cloud option is the convenient option, right? It's the, the less friction option. So yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. So I would, I would ask, I would ask this to you a lot. Do you, do you ever see a world where, uh, Bitcoin self custody, I wouldn't say goes completely mainstream. I think there's a portion of the population that are always just gonna, you know, uh, they're just, they're just never going to go down that route. But do you think that we'll ever get to a point where, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40% of the population are, are actually, you know, uh, holding their own keys. And the reason I'm throwing those numbers out there is because I think that's when things really start to change. I think, you know, if you have, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of the population is as like truly sovereign individuals where the state can't just, you know, confiscate their wealth at, at the flick of a switch. I, I think things will change. I, I think, you know, uh, and perhaps this is like the, you know, Bitcoin utopian idea. Perhaps this is like kind of the sovereign individual thesis that we all want to see play out. But, you know, do you think that we'll ever get to that point? Um, and then you know, of course, your company is playing a major kind of role in this to make self custody uh, convenient, right? Make self make self custody accessible. I think is a is a good word as well. That's tough. Um, I I th think that we should be looking. of better incentive technology. Uh, there's also just the scalability question, right? Um, so it seems to me like a more likely scenario, both from a technical scaling perspective and from a sort of user responsibility perspective, is that you know, something like the Fediment model seems to me like it's a more feasible path forward where you know, the vast majority of people aren't directly 
only controlling their keys, but they are outsourcing it to a sort of semi-trusted group of other people. You know, that that is an improvement upon having a just a single point of failure bank that can uh, basically rug pull you and do everything. But uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, like, like we said, the, it's a complicated question to answer because it's a big world and different people have different incentives and uh, accessibility to systems that are more convenient. So you know, people who are in first world countries who have uh, decent access to financial infrastructure, I think are gonna be the laggards to adopt this technology just because the incentives aren't there. So, you know, watch Africa and you know, watch some of these other nations where I think we're gonna see Bitcoin adoption uh, accelerate faster than in the first world, or at least the adoption that's happening in the first world is all financialized adoption, you know, through traditional financial investment vehicles, which is not particularly interesting from a sovereignty or a cypherpunk perspective. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I agree with that. I think I, I tweeted this out actually a uh, couple, couple weeks ago, which I basically said like, I'm more bullish on the, the adoption of Bitcoin in the developing world versus the adoption of Bitcoin in the developed world. And it just, cause it not only convenience, but also the, the, it, what better incentive than necessity, right? If, yep. I mean, you know, if you live in a country with relative, a relatively stable fiat currency, Again, are you in, and the bread and circuses are strong and you have Cash App and you have Venmo and you have PenPal and you have Zelle, um, you know, what incentive do you have to try an alternative, right? Um, and I think, you know, if you live in a country like Venezuela, Argentina, you know, Nigeria, like Africa, like what you said, like Africa, and I think you have the incentive to try something new, to try an alternative because <laughs> the current system is so fundamentally broken that you don't have a choice but to find but to try something new. Yeah, I mean, I spent my first couple of years when I was interested in Bitcoin, you know, extolling the virtues of this new protocol and uh, you know trying to convert people, but I gave up after a year or two because uh, I realized I was only getting like a, a 1% conversion rate. I was, I was basically preaching uh, to a bunch of people who didn't see the need for it because uh, we had a stable system uh, where people's money wasn't getting inflated away. And my claims that the money was going to get inflated away, you know, basically came off as like conspiracy theorist, even though there was so much history to show that it happens. It was once again, the, uh, the frogs simmering in the pot of water and me yelling at them that it was going to start boiling. Uh, so, you know, people didn't actually take notice until just uh, the past few years when it finally caught up with them. So yeah, you go where the incentives are. That's my time and you're trying to convince people. Uh, we just need to keep making the products better so that when people realize that they do need it, that they don't feel overwhelmed when they try to use it. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that's, you know, you hit the nail on the head, right? I, I'm so, I'm so sick and tired of, of trying to work. And then they think you're crazy, right? So it's like, oh yeah, like this is, you know, my crazy, you know, Bitcoin brother, whatever. And, you know, of course, they always remember the first time you told them about it and the number go up, does its thing. And they're like, wow, OK, maybe this was a good idea. Right. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm at that point. I know my my co-host is as well. He's super jaded. He's like, you know what? I just I don't care anymore. Uh, you know, we cover this. We talk about this. But we've reached this point where it's like, look, like, you know, I could show you the door. What, what's the Satoshi quote, the famous Satoshi quote? Like, you know, if you don't get it, you don't understand. I, I, I don't have time to explain it to you. Something along those lines. I totally butchered the paraphrase. <laughs> but um, but uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, I, I've definitely got to that point. So, OK, great. So a couple questions for you. So we're kind of entering into this new era in Bitcoin's history. So I mean, what do I mean by that? We have the approval of the ETFs, right? This large amount of Bitcoin 
held by Coinbase, which is just one 6102 order away from the U.S. government. Uh, you have uh, the kind of the validation or the vindication of the uh, using Bitcoin as an alternative to cash on the public company level. You have uh, Bitcoin entering the kind of nation state discussion with what Naim Bukele is doing it, what Naim Bukele is doing in El Salvador. So glad that he made his reserves public, by the way, and he posted that address. I think that's a great step in the right direction. Uh, so, you know, it's almost as if, and Lop, you've been here a lot longer than I have, right? But it's almost as if, you know, Bitcoin is growing up in a way, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's almost like as if it's, uh, it's, it's heading into this next phase. So, you know, what, what does this look like from your perspective? Uh, what, what, are the, what do the next five years look like? Well, so it's all about uh, the game theory and the incentives, right? Is uh, all of the stuff that you just mentioned, it's, it's new and yet it's not new. Uh, really, the difference is that the level of players who are entering the game is orders of magnitude greater in terms of wealth and power. But they're doing it for the same reasons that we did it 10 plus years ago, which was that you know we wanted to exit the system that was corrupted and that had rules that couldn't be relied upon. And, and so we basically opted out and we did so with whatever money we had available to us. And you know, it just took a long time for a bunch of uh, relatively poor autistic nerds to you know come together and build the system up uh, and you know, get more people interested in it and understanding like why it could be beneficial to them and and now we're playing in the big leagues and so we're we're at the sort of uh, global corporations slash small nation state level and i think this is where things get really interesting right is because the the small nation states especially those that don't have their own currency and are basically pegged to some other nation states currency uh, that is a massive point of control. And if you're a nation state in that position, then you would probably be pretty interested in exiting from that particular arrangement as well. So I think that it's only a matter of time that basically, you know, what happened with, with me and a bunch of the other early adopters where, you know, we would adopt Bitcoin, learn about it, use it, understand its uh, you know, pros and cons and uh, sort of uh, hone our narratives and our pitches of why other people should be interested in it. That same thing is now playing out, but you've got Michael Saylor going around and pitching it from a sort of business perspective to a lot of his billionaire buddies. Uh, you've got uh, Bukele going around you know, pitching it to other uh, leaders of nation states that are in similar precarious positions and basically saying, look, we don't have to play by the rules of the Bank of International Settlements. We don't have to play by the rules of the Federal Reserve. We have other options now. So let's explore those options. So, you know, that is why I think there is going to be another massive wave of adoption. You, know, you could call it institutional level of adoption or, or whatever. But um, it's just more people entering the game and they're doing so because they understand that it's beneficial to them. And, you know, this could also, it goes all the way back to the original Satoshi quote of like, uh, you know, it, uh, it might be worth getting a little bit just in case it catches on. I mean, absolutely. Uh, drop mic moment there. Does it does it surprise you? Uh, does it surprise you that Bitcoin has come this far? Did you know from initially that it was, you know, it, it, of course the incentive structure is there, right? The, the Bitcoin just has superior incentives. I, I truly believe that's why it's winning the way it is. And I think that, you know, government money, fiat money relies a tremendous amount on coercion. If I were to make a bet on you know, wh who's going to win that race incentives versus coercion. I'm going to put my money on incentives every single time. Right. Um, usually when you have to kind of build a wall to keep people, in, it usually tends not to work out for you. 
Um, so yeah, did you know, did you know that it was, it was gonna, you know, did, did you know that, did you have some type of like intuition, some type of gut feeling that, you know, Bitcoin had the potential to reach the heights that it has reached in, in a, in a considerably short amount of time as well? No, I definitely did not expect uh, the acceleration. Um, I remember, you know, when I, I first got onto Mount Gox back in the day and I was like, I should get me some of these Bitcoins that uh, I saw it as a like 30 to 40 year type of investment of like, uh, I don't know that this thing is necessarily going to become much more valuable, but I do have confidence that the rules and the incentives of the system will make it not become as less valuable as the you know fiat currencies as you know just looking at that like hundred year time scale uh, value of the dollar chart I, mean, I was relatively certain that that was not going to happen with Bitcoin but I certainly didn't expect uh, the the heights that we've gotten to already so quickly and so you know from from that perspective in some ways it feels like uh, Bitcoin might have kind of gone over its skis a bit in the sense that um, I don't think that we have improved the the protocol you know the scalability the privacy so on and so forth I don't I don't think that we've quite got the protocol to the level that we can have the mass adoption that we would all like to see and um, and I think that's going to become a particularly interesting, contentious issue in coming years. Like you're already seeing discussion happen around it. Uh, and, and some people are like trying to turn it into like another scaling debates of small blocks versus big blocks uh, versus um, you know, layered development and so on. And it's going to be a really complicated uh, road to, to travel down, I think, because we are going to have to ask ourselves a lot of questions around what trade-offs we believe are important because you know if we if we continue down the path we're going right now now you know their take here on the uh you know, technological progression scale and my main thing is I want us to explore as many paths as possible, uh, you know, trying to sort of optimize for the potential outcomes of what can happen with Bitcoin. Because, you know, Hal Finney, I think, theorized very early on that uh, Bitcoin would basically turn into another type of gold where it was all held by a small number of banks and that basically you know those banks would issue IOUs and stuff and you know that's one potential dystopian future if we don't continue to improve the scalability and really what people can do with self custody but um, you know I, th I think we're also going to see a lot of hybrid uh, and new types of models especially on second layer networks where it might be a lot more difficult to reason about you know, what is your level of sovereignty on these networks. That's kind of where we are right now, I think, with a lot of debate happening around like what is a real layer two network uh, or you know, what should be considered safe enough to, to store your funds on uh, a layer two or is there any layer two that's safe enough for a long term store of value? Uh, a lot of open questions and uh, a lot of work remaining to be done. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I agree. And, you know, the, the, and, and again, I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm going to use this word. Um, I'm approaching it from a convenience standpoint at the, the, not the self custody aspect, but from the, uh, my, just my lightning wallet. Right. Um, and I remember the, I don't want to say it was a rug pull, but just wallet of Satoshi, uh, deciding yeah. that they're going to leave the U S and you know, I had a couple hundred dollars on Wall of Satoshi and I was using that as like my daily daily driver for for lighting custodial wallet. Right. You know, there's an element of trust there. Uh, then they rug pulled in the U.S. I'm like, oh, I called a, a good friend of mine, Ben Perrin. I'm like, hey, man, <laughs> like, what do, what, do, what do I use? You know, like what, what? he's like, you have to use Phoenix. But however, you, you have to send a large amount first. Uh, you can't just send a, a yeah. small transaction. I use I use Mun Wallet for a while. Had a terrible uh, 
uh, had a terrible experience in a certain situation with 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 Moon or Mun. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and then I finally kind of ended up with um, using the Primal and then the Get Albi, and then you connect the Get Albi wallet with um, with the blue wallet, and then that kind of creates a good experience. Then strike. Yeah, but almost nobody's gonna do that. Yeah, no one's gonna do that, and it's like highly complicated, right? Like it's not an easy like kind of uh, step. So, and, and then of course, like it, 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 I, I think it's like semi. It's 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 self custodial. I think it, they make you write down twelve words, but you don't really know what's going on in the back end. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that like. You know, the current state of Lightning, the current state of second layer solutions after Wall of Satoshi left the U.S. is not in a good place right now. Like it is not in a good place. It, 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 I think Strike, you can make the argument that they have a, you know, relatively good Lightning experience. But it's like, OK, so now my Lightning wallet is an on ramp like that's yeah. pretty crazy. So, um, yeah, I want to get your like, so I want to get your take on that. And then I hear that you mentioned Fediment and uh, Ben was actually showing me or, or we were talking about Fediment and kind of like the things that are moving forward in that. And I, I, I kind of want to join a mint like I got invited to one. So that seems really cool. And like no one really knows each other's identities. And I think that's super cool. Yeah. So what is the current stat status, in your opinion, on second layer Bitcoin? Do you see a do you see a hope for this kind of uh, be getting to a point where it's convenient and accessible enough for people to just you know kind of download it and access it? There's some regulatory hurdles like we saw with Wallet of Satoshi, uh, but do you ever get do you ever see it do you ever uh, do you ever see it getting to that point? It's certainly possible. Um... So I am somewhat optimistic because it seems like there has been an acceleration in development of second layer Bitcoin networks, though I think a lot of these uh, are also somewhat questionable in nature of you know, how permissionless uh, they're going to be. Um, more along the lines of like the potential impact of better second layer networks is that there seems to have been renewed interest and discussion in making some you know opcode changes to the bitcoin base protocol which could potentially greatly accelerate the deployment of some of these second layer networks wallet that's digging. I think I also wrote up uh, about a year ago, uh, I, I did a, a blog post about spider chain, which is another, you know, think of it as like a, a different type of game theory and pegging mechanism to create a uh, second layer of networks. Um, I don't think that they've actually launched on main net yet. I think they might have a test net, but uh, Mostly going back to you know what I said earlier, uh, from a development perspective, I just want to see more experimentation. Like that's the only way that we're going to continue to try to optimize amongst the many, many different potential paths that this ecosystem can take. Or those paths, and we have to look around and then debate the merits and the trade-offs of the the different technologies that we could deploy uh, off of Bitcoin and try to understand, you know, how does this help the network? How might it weaken the network? Uh, you know, what are we actually introducing? And um, you know, what's it worth to us? Like, trade off in terms of you know, being able to get hopefully more adoption, hopefully more uh, self-sovereign adoption of you know people actually interacting with these protocols directly rather than through a third party so you know, lightning is a very interesting thing that you can you could easily spend hours talking about the merits of and you know i think um one of the issues that has come up with lightning is just due to its complexity that once again people seeking convenience and wanting to get a lot of that complexity abstracted away, it leads them once again to centralized custodial solutions. Uh, I could 
and I have spoken about lightning at length, uh, including from the sort of node operation perspective, because, you know, Casa, we actually had one of the first uh, plug and play lightning nodes back in like 2019 or so. I had one. <laughs> and we, we discontinued it because it was, it was quite honestly, uh, it was a great way to lose money as a business. Like it, it was, it was uh, such a high support load, uh, basically for getting for helping people, you know, manage their own networked hardware within within their home environments. You know, within a uh, a network that we had no insight into, and then all of the the different things that can go wrong. Lots of lots and lots of uh, points of failure within that entire hardware and software stack. So I can I can understand you know, why so many people used Wallet of Satoshi because you didn't have to deal with channel management and liquidity and all of these other things that uh, I was saying from the very beginning. Like if if people even need to know what a Lightning channel is, it's never going to be a mainstream thing. So one way or another, that type of complexity has to get abstracted away. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Jameson, I do want to be respectful of your time, and it seems like we are getting to the top of the hour. So I, I want to give you this this opportunity to to our audience. There's about 805 people watching live right now at the moment. Um, if you have any last words for our audience, uh, you know, in regards to our conversation, in regards to the future of Bitcoin, in regards to Casa, what would those last words be? Uh, well, you know, I focus on education. I think that that's probably the best that we can hope for um you you don't need to be an evangelist but i think that you should at least be able to explain some of the concepts of these systems fairly simply and uh do so in such a way that you know your audience um if you know, if you're talking to someone who is not particularly nerdy and you're talking about all the cool technical aspects of Bitcoin, then you're just going to lose them. Um, there are probably at least a dozen different ways that people might be interested in Bitcoin. And I think one of the sort of superpowers of a you know, Bitcoin evangelist, if you want to call them that, is the ability to you know ask a few questions, understand what that person's life is like and what what they care about, what might trigger them. And then if you can find one of those things that they care about, you, you know, tie in the uh, positive aspects of these systems to get them to understand why they might want to at least put some time into researching it, study it. Yeah. Tell people yes. to, to study Bitcoin rather than buy Bitcoin. And I don't know, this is one of my favorite things to say when, when people ask me, like, should I be buying Bitcoin? Uh, I say, you know, uh, if you have to ask, the answer is no. It means you need to go back and you need to study it more until you're you're convinced that you cannot possibly live without having some Bitcoin. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, uh, Lop, it's been uh, Jameson. It's been a uh, it's been an honor to uh, to have you on the show for the first time. Hopefully, we'll get you back on the show uh, in in the future again as well, uh, guys. You could follow Lop at Lop on X and uh, go check out lop.net uh i've used so many resources on on your website uh that i've used in the past but per, my personal favorite are the the stress tests the stress tests mm -hmm. of the uh seed plates and stuff like that <laughs> that was really cool that how you did that so anyways uh jameson thank you so much for for joining us on the show today thanks for having me appreciate it all right, guys, that was our show. If you enjoyed the show and you know what to do, smash the like button, consider subscribing, and we will see you tomorrow for a brand new episode of Satoshi.